Bunga with us this evening. Uh, we welcome him in the Saviour's name. We're delighted that he and his wife Sarah are with us this evening. It's also nice to have some friends from Horizon Church and we welcome you as well to the meeting. It's good to have Pastor Richard Raven with us as well uh, we trust that each one of us will know the Lord's help uh, through the meeting this afternoon. Uh, after the preaching uh, there will be tea and food provided at the back and so we encourage you all to wait with us please for that time of fellowship after the ministry of the word and the rest of the announcements are in the bulletin i'm going to read psalm 117 psalm 117 is the shortest of the psalms and yet like all of them in a few words there are such depths so Psalm 117 is a call to the nations to worship God, which of course we only are enabled to do through the gospel of grace. Oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Praise him, all ye people, for his merciful kindness is great towards us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. We'll seek the Lord's face in prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank Thee for all that we do have in our Lord to worship Thee for. We thank Thee for the glorious gospel of grace. And we pray that our hearts will be thrilled as we have this season of worship together. Come near, we pray, in our Lord's name we ask. Amen. Our brother Bevis is going to come and lead us in the singing. In our worship, I sing from Psalm 23, that's on page 20, and we'll stand together as we sing, please, so we all know this well, we will be without excuse if we don't sing it out with all our hearts. Let's stand together and sing. <laughs>
we'll seek the Lord again, please, in prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank thee, O Lord, that we have a shepherd. Thank thee that our Lord Jesus in his ministry confirmed that he was the shepherd of this son. We thank thee for those beautiful words where he said that he would lay down his life for his sheep. We thank thee that it is on that basis that we approach unto thee this evening. That we can say, as the Lord's people, the Lord is my shepherd. Oh, what an amazing thing that the Lord would go after us. And we confess, O oh Lord, that we were lost sheep. But we thank thee for the pursuit of the shepherd after the sheep. We thank thee for the shepherd that has laid down his life for us. That he took that life again, that he has risen. We thank thee for that great assurance that he will bring all his sheep home to glory. We thank thee that our Saviour shall say, here am, I, here am I, and the children that thou hast given to me. O oh Lord, we thank thee for the great security that we have in our blessed Saviour, the great hope that we have in the gospel of grace. And we ask, O oh Lord, that the hearts of thy children in the meeting this afternoon will joy again in the wonder of God saving grace. So we pray that every part of this meeting will have the rich blessing of the Lord upon it. O oh Lord, we do cry to thee that thou will be pleased to humble our hearts before thee, deliver us from foolish pride, we ask. O oh Lord, we cry to thee that those that have gathered that are discouraged in heart, that their hearts this evening will be encouraged in the things of the Lord. We pray, Lord, that there will indeed be a word in season for him that is weary. For those who have fallen into sin, we pray, Lord, that the word of God will come that piercing sword to them. And yet, Lord, we pray for that sweet balm fresh of the gospel. O oh, Lord, we pray for any in our meeting this evening that is yet know thee not. O oh, Lord, we cry to thee as they sit among the people of God that the scales will be taken from off their eyes. We pray that blinded eyes will be opened. The sinners this evening will be brought to a saving knowledge of thyself. And we thank thee for bringing Pastor Ronald and Sarah among us this afternoon. And we thank thee for the work of God that thy servant is engaged in in Zambia. We thank thee, Lord, for how thou hast been using him. And we cry to thee that even that flock today will know the Lord's hand upon them. And, O oh Lord, we pray that thy servant and his wife during this time in Perth will be richly blessed of the Lord. And may we pray for all of the meetings that he conducts, that in each one of them, that he will know the mighty hand of God resting upon him. Grant thy servant all the enablement that he needs in the ministry of thy word, we pray. Lord, we commit this nation to thee. O oh Lord, our hearts lament the hardness on every side. O oh Lord, we lament the apathy towards spiritual things, the lack of concern over the well-being of the soul. O oh Lord, we cry to thee in wrath, Remember mercy. 
We pray to thee that we will, even in our time, witness the genuine, mighty reviving of the Holy Spirit of God. And Lord, we do not desire the counterfeit, but we desire that genuine work of the Lord in the hearts of men and women. And to that end, revive thy church, revive this little company here this evening, we pray. And we pray that we will be able then to rise and to stand for thee in this evil day. So continue with us, we do pray in our Lord's name and Christ. Amen. 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 We'll continue our worship by praying to him 580 on page 410. A sovereign protect our hand, unseen yet forever at hand. And we'll stand together again for this as we sing. 587. <coughs>
Thank you, Bevis, for leading in the singing. And again, we're delighted to have Pastor Ronald with us this evening. We welcome him sincerely in our Lord's name. And we'll ask him if he'll come now and pray for the Lord's message. Please turn your Bibles to Hebrews and chapter 11. This evening I will be reflecting on Hebrews 12, verse 1 through to 3. And when I was first asked to come and uh, preach here, my mind went to that text and I was going to speak on a narrower theme regarding endurance. Well, my theme has expanded somewhat since then, but I'll still be speaking from Hebrews and chapter 12. Let's pick up the reading from verse 17 of Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, we read from verse 17, we read on chapter 12, verse 1 through to 3. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, men mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. They were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he took Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, assaying to do, were drowned. By faith, walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, the hallowed Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah of David also, and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, 
escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were men strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women who received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others a trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sown asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with perseverance or patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Or consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against him, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy word to each one of our hearts. I'm thankful to the Lord for the invitation and the opportunity to minister here. And I trust the Lord himself will be pleased to bless us as we hear his word. Now, this evening I want to speak to you on the theme running the Christian race and to do that I will draw your attention to this well-known passage of scripture Hebrews 12 and verse 1 through to 3. The book of Hebrews as you probably know divides itself into two parts. The first part, running from chapter 1 right through to 11, is doctrinal, and the second, running from chapters 12 through to the end, is practical or applicable. The doctrinal part holds up the superiority of Christ's priesthood over that of Aaron. The applicable part, on the other hand, consists of practical exhortations urging the Hebrews to be constant in their faith and service of Christ by virtue of his superiority. Now at the time the writer to the Hebrews penned this message, many believers having stepped out of Judaism into Christianity wanted to reverse their course as a way of escaping persecution by their own countrymen. The writer to the Hebrews exhorts them not to give up on Christianity, but to press on to maturity in that faith. His appeal was based on the superiority of Christ over the Judaic system. Christ is better he seems to be saying, he is better than the angels, for they worship him. He is better than Moses, for he created him. He is better than the Aaronic priesthood, for his sacrifice was 
for all time. He is better than the law. For he mediates a better covenant. In short, there is more to be gained in Christ than there is to be lost in Judaism. Our text is part of the practical section. The writer here urges his readers to look to Jesus. And this evening, I wish likewise to exhort you here at this Presbyterian Church to look to Jesus, to look to no other than Jesus, even as you run your Christian race as individuals and as a corporate body of God's people. Like the Jewish believers of old, you may be facing the temptation of sliding back from your faith. Are you perhaps being enticed to embrace legalism? That is to say, it is enough to obey the law, to do it in our own strength, and we don't need Jesus. Or perhaps you being enticed to embrace antinomianism, which would be saying, because we have Christ, we don't need the law. It is enough that we have him. And so you live your life in Christ, in inverted commas, without the law. Whatever temptation you may be facing, I wish to say to you this evening, look unto Jesus. Like the Jewish believers of all, you may be suffering persecution at the hand of your fellow countrymen who may be calling you to compromise, to leave your rigid faith, to hang to, Christian, to Christianity loosely, to worship the gods of secularism and humanism and religious pluralism, to worship civil rights. I wish to urge you not to yield to that, but to look unto Jesus. It may also be that you are being threatened by various powerful waves people with forceful ability, Satan perhaps, the, the dazzling things of the world, they are all conspiring to shake your faith, to sap up the joy you have in the Lord, to, to derail you, to, to make you fail as a Christian. Like the Apostle Peter, when he was challenged and invited to walk on water, and to walk toward Christ. But instead he began to look at the waves. And as he did so, he began to sink. Are you sinking? Because you have stopped looking at Jesus. I would like this evening boldly to say to you, look unto Jesus. To look to Jesus means to firmly gaze upon him. There may be rival attention, so to say, but you must keep your gaze firmly on him. There may be rival attractions, but you must keep your gaze firmly upon him. And that gaze must be Deliberate. Look unto Jesus. The writer to the Hebrews compares our Christian walk to running a race in order to win the prize. And when running a race, it is best 
that we are not looking at our feet or looking over our shoulders or looking at waves or looking at other attractions we must keep our gaze on Jesus now concerning the need to run this race in order to win the prize there are five things I want to share with you very quickly five things first notice with me the prize to be won in the race the prize to be won in the race and according to verse 40 of chapter 11 the prize is what the writer to the Hebrews refers to as the perfection the perfection God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect but perfection that's the prize to be just men made perfect that's the prize to possess the resurrected body the better resurrection that's the prize to possess the glorification of the body to have a conformity to the image of Christ inside and out that's the prize or to use the language of verse 26 of chapter 11 the prize is what he refers to as the reward the city of the living God which has a foundation whose builder maker is God the ultimate reward is to have God dwelling with us. To have God wiping away every tear from our eyes. To be in that state of affairs where there is no more death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain. To be in the state of affairs where the former things pass away and new things. That's the prize. The prize to be won in the race. Secondly, notice with me the hindrances we meet with during the race. The hindrances we meet with during the race. And I want to speak about three hindrances. And the first one is mentioned right here in our text in verse 1 what the writer to the Hebrews refers to as the sin which doth so easily beset us we can refer to it as besetting sin besetting sin may be a hindrance a besetting sin is a sin that lingers on even after we have become Christians. When we become Christians, we are declared righteous. We are forgiven of our sins, past, present, and future sins. We stand righteous before God. We stand confident before God. And yet, there may be a sin that lingers on. Maybe sinful anger, or unbelief, or lust. That one sin that above all others is likely to hold you back from progress, perhaps to keep you down. I wonder what your besetting sin is. You are doing well everywhere else but when you will do good that sin hold you back that sin rears its ugly head it's the one sin over which you cry the most it's the one sin you pray about the most if only I can overcome this if only I could defeat this then I will be making better progress Hold you back 
I wonder what that sin is. The certain sin may be a hindrance. The indwelling sin in general may be a hindrance. You stand right before God. You've been forgiven. When he looks at you in Christ Jesus, he sees a righteous person. And yet you do know, don't you, that there is sin within you. What in Romans chapter 7 is referred to as indwelling sin. Paul cried much about that. When he would do good, he testified evil was right there with him. People may look at you and praise you, but within yourself, you know, you feel the fact that you are rotten. You are not where you should be. Sin is right there with you. In your closet. Perhaps the most holy of places this side of eternity. When you are with God alone. Wrestling with him. Sometimes being lifted to great heights of joy. Even when you are there. Suddenly you do feel, don't you, that sin was right there with you. Evil was right there with you. That may be a hindrance. Thirdly, the temptation that comes from without may be a hindrance. May keep you from finishing the race. Temptation from Satan and temptation from the world, temptation from your phone, temptation from the stadiums, temptation is everywhere. All that may stand and could very well be standing in the way of your progress, in the way of winning race. The hindrances we meet with during the race. Let's note in the third place the, the preparation to be made for the race. The preparation to be made for the race. In a real race, a racer must throw off all superfluous clothing before he can effectively compete in the race. Even so, in the Christian race, we must throw off anything that easily ensnares us. The writer of the Hebrews states two things that we must lay aside. Two things he was calling the Hebrews to lay aside. First, he says they needed to divest themselves of every weight. That's what he calls it. Weight. And weight there means a mass or a burden. And the weights you might have had in mind were wrong beliefs. Wrong beliefs can weigh down your heart. And the wrong belief for them could have been this drive to leave Christianity and go back to Judaism, go back to the shadows, to the figures, go back to the animal sacrifices, go back to mosaic sacrifices, so to say. They had a place, didn't they? In their own time, they played an important role, and the role was to point men to Christ. To remind the people of God that Christ is not here, but he is there. He is coming. He is the only Savior, but he is yet to come. These are but shadows, helps, age. The substance is not yet here. They wanted to go back to the shadows, to the figures. 
to the age. And he's telling them here, no, no, don't do that. Divest yourselves of every weight of such beliefs. They will entangle your feet. They will distract your attention. They will deplete your energies. Don't do that. They will take you out of the race. You need to go beyond Moses. You need to look beyond Aaron. You need to look to Christ. Take off the weights. When you are running a race, you don't put on gumboots and the hard hats and jackets. You take them off. You want to be as light as possible. Even so, in the Christian race, you need to ask yourself, what is it that is weighing you down? Pulling you back. Make it in, making it impossible for you to run fast, to run swiftly, so you can win the race. I ask, what is it? That is weighing you down. What are those weights? What are those wrong beliefs? Things you have held on to that don't really help you, that don't make you efficient, that don't sharpen your zeal and make yourself God better. What are those things that you need? lay aside. We must divest ourselves of every weight. Secondly, we must divest ourselves of the sin that easily besets us. We've already spoken about those sins that linger on. We must put them out. To beset, read that word in verse 1, is to skillfully surround and in the context of a racer the idea is to, to surround him in every direction so as to thwart every one of his moves. He wants to run the course but he is surrounded and so he cannot run. He cannot see where he is going. He can't see the prize. Because he's been surrounded in every direction. Even so, besetting sin can thwart your goal of finishing the race, of seeing the tracks, seeing the prize. Besetting sin can invade and surround you everywhere, so you are unable to run. You are unable, therefore, to finish the race. Divest yourself of that. It is said that the army of Alexander the Great, you've all heard about him, you've all read about him, I'm sure, he was advancing on Persia. And at one critical point, it appeared that his troops would be defeated. The soldiers had taken so much plunder from their previous campaigns that they had become weighed down and were losing their effectiveness in combat. Alexander immediately commanded that all the spoils be thrown into a heap and burned. The men complained bitterly, understandably, and worked hard to gain the spoil. Now they must burn it. They complained. But they soon came to see the wisdom of the order, and someone wrote concerning that it was as if wings had been given them. They walked lightly again. Victory was assured. Even so, you must burn the weights and the sin you may be carrying, so you may make progress on your way to the celestial city. 
This is the preparation to be made for the rest. If you are not making any progress in your Christian walk, you ought to ask yourself, are they weights you still carry? The sins you are holding on to? Are there things in your life that are standing in the way, keeping you from making progress? Get rid of them. Get rid of them. And it will be well. But let's hurry on in the fourth place and look at the fortitude required to win the race. The fortitude required to win the race. The writer to the Hebrews says, the race must be run with endurance, with patience. Take a look at that in verse 1. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. That word patience can also be translated as endurance. It refers to staying power or stamina or resistance. Even as you run, you must have staying power. Those that are in the race need to have staying power. And the race he has in mind is probably not a hundred meter dash, but a long distance race, which calls for so much more endurance. And often, as people run that race, many times they feel like giving up. They feel like they're running out of energy. And not just energy, but air. But they must carry on. They must go on. They must learn to manage their minds, to remain focused until they get to the end. Running with patience involves, first of all, not being swerved from your God. Even by the greatest of trials and suffering. I remember watching a boxing march in 1974 between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman in the Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo. It was known as Zaire then. It was called Rambo in the Jungle. George Foreman was the champion. Muhammad Ali was the challenger. They were to fight over 15 rounds turned out to be only eight. And George Foreman was the favorite. First round, second round, third round, fourth round, five, six, seven, pounded Ali. We all felt sorry for Ali. Ali seems to have been in that battle just to defend himself and protect himself as Foreman pounded him everywhere. And we kept wondering how long Ali would last for. Ali was actually the, fav the favorite in the eyes of the, uh, the fans. Everyone was cheering him on. Ali Bumaye, Ali Bumaye. But he was on the receiving end all the time until the eighth round. By which time, Foreman was so tired. <laughs> Foreman's plan was to defeat Ali within the first three rounds. So he put in everything. Beyond the third round, Foreman was losing his energies. By the eighth round, he was done. 
and Ali knew it. In the eighth round, Ali came out of himself and gave Foreman, I think it was three punches, and he was done. Never to start again. Ali won the match. The point is, what kept Ali going? Endurance. Patience. That's what you need to be doing as a Christian. You need to endure. You need to be patient. You need to be able to put up with much. Even if it was suffering or pain. Agony. Sometimes shame. You, you need to be put, you need to be able to put up with that in order to win the Christian race. Not being swerved from your goal, even by the greatest trials and suffering. Endurance calls for being loyal to faith, being loyal to piety, in spite of the greatest trials and sufferings. It calls for loyalty like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, like Daniel was. They were loyal to faith. Even in the face of danger, even in the face of death, they were loyal to faith. Even so, you must be loyal to your faith. Even if you have to lose some of your comfort, you must be loyal to faith. Even if you have to go through pain, you must be loyal to faith. That's what endurance looks like. Let's come to the fifth and final point, which is the inspiration we need for the race. The inspiration we need for the race. And there was inspiration from two sources. The first is the inspiration that comes from the crowd of witnesses. Listen to how the writer to the Hebrews puts it, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about we saw great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every way and the sin which does so easily beset us. We have men who have gone before us, who started the race and had finished the race. Were these mentioned? in Hebrews chapter 11, whose lives were a great testimony to their faith. And, and they were witnesses, that's what they are called here. They are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And they were witnesses in the sense that they personally ran the race themselves. They experienced the same challenges we experienced. They knew what it was to be faced with danger, to be tempted everywhere. And yet, they did finish the race. Abraham, we read about him in verse 8. He was much tried, but he did not waver. Moses, he could have become Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, but he chose to give that up. He chose to suffer affliction for the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. He esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And why did he do that? Because he looked to a greater reward. He looked to the perfection that we spoke about earlier on. Then we read about Gideon, Barak, 
Samson and Jephthah, David and Samuel and the prophets, they all obtained a good testimony through faith. And we will be rewarded together with them if we remain faithful. It started, it finished. You must start and you must finish. Don't give up. Keep running. Run. Run. Always run until you get to the end. And you have many, many, many men and women to draw inspiration from. They run and they finish their race. Well, the chief inspiration in the second place must come from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Listen, in verse 2, it says, looking unto Jesus. As you run your race, being cheered on by those who have gone before you, look unto Jesus. And it's interesting that he doesn't say, look unto this great cloud of witnesses. Does he say that? Oh, no. He doesn't say that. Yes, we must draw inspiration from them. But we mustn't look to them. They were men, sinful men. They could fail. When we look carefully at their lives, we will find that they all have their shortcomings. No, no. The one we must look to and draw our chief inspiration from is Jesus Christ. Why? Well, first of all, we are told that he, he provided the first example of perseverance in suffering. In the days of his flesh, he, he trod and deviatingly the path of faith. He trod undeviatingly a path that perhaps no other man had trod. And we read that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. He started the Christian faith and he will bring it to that place that he designed for it. He authored it. He will finish it. His own race, he started it and he finished it. He had a joy set before him. And that joy that was set before him drove him to endure the cross, to despise its shame. And the joy was the promises God had given to him. The promise of a bride Amazing how brides can move us to do things. The promise of a bride. And his bride was the church. You are his bride. You, if you are a child of God, are the people he had in mind. God had promised him a bride. To get his bride, he must go through suffering. To get his bride, he must endure the cross. To get his bride, he must despise the shame that went with suffering upon the cross. It wasn't just a bride promised to him. There was a glory promised to him. 
He was promised a position, a name. He was to sit at the right hand of the throne of God. And the name that is above every name will be given to him such that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. All of that was before Jesus. Even as he ran his race. He drew inspiration from that, encouragement from that, and he finished the race. He now sits at the right hand of God. And he sits also cheering us on, but he's not just cheering us on, he is running alongside us, and he's not just doing that. He has given us his spirit. He's given us power. He has enabled us to run, to get to the end. And we will. And not only that, he is the rewarder of all who complete the race. Finish this race. Is that the finish line? He's cheering you on. He's helping you. He's inspiring you. He's urging you on. And when you get to the end, he will reward you. He will reward you. He will enable you to share in his glory, to receive the reward experience the perfection to live with him in the new heaven and the new earth forever and ever for that is the race I want to say to, to, to say to you again let us therefore run run with endurance Run with perseverance the race that is marked out for you until at length you have received the prize for which you have been called heavenwards. Don't give up. Don't give up the race, you beloved. Free Presbyterian Church. Don't give up. It's hard going. Maybe discouraging. Don't give up. Run. Run. Always run until you get to the end. And while you run, look to Jesus. Amen.
Lord for these moments that we have spent in thy presence under the sound of thy word. Lord, there is great solace and comfort and encouragement for our hearts in thy, in thy unfailing word of truth. Lord, we do pray for those who are discouraged in their faith, that, oh Lord, they might uh, find fresh zeal and strength this night in thy word. May the knees that are quaking and trembling be strengthened. May heads that are drooping be lifted again to look up to our Saviour. Oh Lord, we thank you for him who loved us and gave himself for us and ever lives to make intercession for his saints. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. Amen.